Good morning, Horizon. Stand and worship with us.
same gown who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord. Shines for all 
pray together. Father, we are, we're grateful that outside of a killing field in Jerusalem, there's a, there's a tomb 
with a stone rolled back and nothing inside. And because that tomb is empty, we are we are reassured we have the hope, we have the confidence that sin and the curse and death, evil, doesn't have the final say. That hope gives us, it gives us a place to turn to when our marriage is in trouble, when our kids wander off, when our finances are in distress and our health is at risk because we know that there's a God who resurrects from the dead. There's a God who takes the hopeless and turns it into hopeful things. And so we ask for each person who brought here today something that they're afraid might die. We ask that they would turn to you and let it live. We thank you that Jesus gives us that place where we can find hope, a place where we can turn. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, welcome someone to Horizons, will you? The King above all kings This is amazing grace Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Thanks for coming out to worship with us this morning. We are happy to have you with us on a, uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed the absolutely gorgeous weekend we've enjoyed so far. It is really my kind of weather, like 50 in the morning, doesn't get past 75. It's wonderful. So I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. We're happy to have you with us this morning. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, my name's Lucas Jarrett. I'm the Connect Pastor here at Horizons Church. And if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, you're new or recent maybe, right over there after the service where that welcome sign just lit up, Pastor Steve will be hanging out over there and he would love to get a chance to meet you and um, tell you a little bit about what we do and uh, how we do it around here, what we're all about. So head right over there, introduce yourself. We'd love to meet you. And um, so do that after the service, if that is you. Okay. Uh, also, if you haven't downloaded the Horizons Church app, as always, uh, do that. Uh, there is uh, some useful tools there, in-service tools and otherwise that you can access all right there, handy dandy through the app, sermon catalog, connection card, some notes, uh, all that good stuff right there in one place for you in your pocket. All right. And if you would like to begin or continue partnering with us financially, we are grateful and thankful for each and every one of you that do that. Um, if you would like to continue or begin doing so, as always, four ways to give. You can uh, use any of those you would like. Uh, they all get to the same place. All roads lead to Rome, right? That's the perfect example of this. Um, you can drop it in the bucket on the way out after service. You can mail it back to us. You can go online to horizonschurch.net, uh, or you can even text to give if you would so uh, feel so inclined to do so, okay? Uh, a couple other quick notes. Uh, reminded you guys last week about it, but just a quick reminder again. We have these available for you out in the lobby. These are the, uh, I'll get to that in just a moment. I'm coming to it, okay? Don't rush me. I am, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm only so fast. You can't rush this sort of thing. Uh, first, first, uh, we have uh, some of these available. Remind you about them last week. Uh, just a quick note again that if you would like uh, this graphic that we've been referencing throughout the series and we will continue to do so, uh, it's out in the lobby um, on those uh, black kind of kiosk, kidney bean looking things. So pick some of these up, take them home with you if you feel so inclined. And now, finally, we have arrived at child dedications. There we go. Uh, so next weekend on Mother's Day, a uh, very fitting weekend to do this. We are going to be dedicating children. So if you've got a little one that hasn't been dedicated yet, uh, this would be a perfect opportunity uh, to do that for them. This is a wonderful, beautiful thing that we get to do, and so uh, we, would, we would love to do this for as many of you as would uh, like us to do it. So whatever service you attend, uh, just let us know when you sign up online for child dedications. Just let us know when to look for you, and we will do it at whatever service you will be at that weekend, okay? So if that's you, go online, sign up for that, all right? I think the only other thing for me is the prayer room right over here, my left, your right. Uh, there's somebody in there praying for us now. They will be there throughout the service as always. So if you'd like somebody to pray with you, make use of that at any point in time, okay? I think that is it for me. There is a quick video announcement and then Pastor Steve will be up to deliver the message. We are about to listen to a message taught from God's word. This is one of the most important parts of our gathering. 
Therefore, we ask you to silence your cell phone, not engage in conversation, and not allow your child to cause a distraction. If your little one does create a distraction, we kindly ask you to respect those around you by taking your child to our clean, safe nursery, using our family viewing area in the cafe, or one of our cry rooms located behind you, where you can see and hear everything, and your child will appreciate the extra freedom. We are in a series that's uh, entitled Flourishing, and it's covering the seven foundational virtues out of which all other virtues grow. And uh, we called it Flourishing because as we build those habits into our life, our Christian life flourishes, our impact for Christ flourishes, and when Christians' impact in the world flourishes, we become salt and light to the world around us, and we make a difference not only in individual lives, but even in, a national, in our national lives. And so we have already covered two of those foundational virtues, uh, self-control and wisdom. Today we are covering the third, which is justice. Manasseh Cutler delivered his Sunday sermon, got into his carriage, and headed for New York City because Manasseh Cutler was on a mission. The Revolutionary War was over. Part of the Continental Congress was in Philadelphia hammering out the Constitution, and the rest of the Congress was in New York City running the country. And so Manasseh Cutler headed for New York City. But he wasn't going to New York to lodge a complaint or to ask for money. He was going to New York to help the Continental Congress solve a problem. You see, the French had helped fund the American Revolution, but when it was over, they wanted to be repaid. But we couldn't repay them because America was cash poor but land rich, and, well, our leaders were so overwhelmed with running the country, they couldn't seem to find a way to solve that problem. But Manasseh Cutler had a plan. When America won its independence, it doubled in size virtually overnight. Because when England lost the war, they not only gave up the 13 colonies, they also turned over a large tract of land to America the size of France. That uh, untamed wilderness was located north and west of the Ohio River, and therefore it was called the Northwest Territory. Now, trappers and explorers had ventured into that region, but there were no settlements there. The government had plenty of land to sell, but no one was willing to buy a tract of land and settle in that new territory unless the Congress, unless Congress set up a charter for that ter territory that gave the settlers ownership of that land and assured them that they, they had a pathway to, to uh, statehood. Consequently, the Northwest Territory found itself in something of a catch-22. The uh, settlers wouldn't buy the land without the Congress, without a charter from Congress, and Congress wouldn't draw up a charter for the new territory without settlers. And so the wheels of government ground to a halt. But then Manasseh Cutler rode into town with a proposal. He asked to meet with the members of Congress, and he offered to buy a large tract of land in the Northwest Territory and establish the very first settlement there. And since Congress was too busy to draw up a charter for the new territory, Manasseh Cutler drew one up for them and presented it to Congress. Now, the leaders of our nation were very impressed with Pastor Cutler because he was obviously a man of character. He wasn't asking for money. He had enough financial backing to buy one and a half million acres of land. And he wasn't, he wasn't angling for some political position in this new territory. He was just a pastor from the outskirts of Boston who was representing a group of pioneers who wanted to establish a settlement in the Northwest Territory. All Manasseh Cutler needed to proceed forward with his plan was for Congress to sell him the land and approve his charter, which Congress immediately refused to do. They said that some of the members of Congress had issues with certain articles in his charter, and therefore they would like to meet with him and make certain important changes. And Pastor Cutler graciously thanked them, uh, the members of Congress, for their time and then announced that if they chose, chose not to approve his charter, then his, his business in New York was finished and he would return to Boston without the purchase of the land. 
Well, congressmen were taken back that Cutler was willing to walk away empty-handed and ask him to reconsider, but he declined and told him he'd be leaving for, for Boston the next day. Well, that got the wheels of Congress moving, and, and before Pastor Cutler could leave for home, he received an urgent message asking him to return to the halls of Congress because, well, they, had, they wanted him to consider some minor changes to his charter, and so he returned. But the changes that they were proposing were not minor. And when it was clear that there was no pathway forward that he could live with, Manasseh Cutler once again announced that he would be leaving for Boston that afternoon. But as he was packing his bags, Congress once again had a change of heart. But this time, they not only accepted Manasseh, Cutler, Manasseh Cutler's offer to buy one and a half million acres of land, they also accepted his charter without changes, without alteration. So Manasseh Cutler left New York City with a deed in his pocket and a charter in his, in his hand, which became known as the Northwest Ordinance. Now, ultimately, those, ultimately, five states were carved out of that Northwest Territory, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and the state that I grew up in, Michigan. And as each of those states were formed, their constitutions were guided by the document that Manasseh Cutler penned and was accepted by Congress. But the settlement to the Northwest Territory actually began with a group of pioneers gathering at Manasseh Cutler's church uh, outside of Boston on December 3rd, 1787, and, set, and they set out for the Ohio River. They boarded flatboats in Pittsburgh and they floated down the river until they came worth to the place where the Muskegon River intersected with the Ohio. And there they put ashore and they carved out the very first settlement in the, in the Northwest Territory. And they named their new home Marietta. Marietta, Ohio. Just 80 miles west of Clarksburg, West Virginia. Now, it was no surprise that the charter that Manasseh Cutler submitted to Congress borrowed heavily from the Constitution of his home state of Massachusetts. And therefore, it's not surprising that his charter guaranteed that those settling in the Northwest Territory would enjoy religious freedom. And it's not surprising that his charter underscored the need for religion, morality, and education in this new territory. But what is surprising about Manasseh Cutler's charter is well, Article 6 in his charter. Because Article 6 wasn't borrowed from anyone's constitution. Rather, it was written by a pastor who was deeply committed to the virtue of justice. It was written by a man who believed that every human being was made in the image of God, and therefore every human being had an innate value and dignity that gave them the right to be treated fairly and justly and with respect. And therefore, when Manasseh Cutler picked up his pen and wrote Article 6 in that charter, he wrote these words, There shall be no slavery, nor involuntary servitude in said territory. Now, the amazing thing is that when Pastor Cutler wrote those words, the injustice of slavery existed in all 13 states in the newly minted United States of America. And yet, because one Christian... One Christian added the virtue of justice to his faith and became salt and light to the halls of Congress because one Christian did that. The United States of America banned slavery from the Northwest Territory and, therefore, and thereby banned it from the five states that emerged from it. The Northwest Territory never experienced the scourge of slavery because one Christian committed to the, to the virtue of justice refused to blink when those in power told him not once but twice that he had to remove Article 6 from his charter if he wanted his settlement in the Northwest Territory to move forward. Every one of those congressmen expected Manasseh Cutler to, to blink <clears throat> and turn his back on justice in order to uh, realize his dream. But he didn't. And because he didn't, slavery was banned in the Northwest Territory. It took 78 years and a bloody civil war for the rest of America to catch up with Pastor Cutler. But when they did, they used his words written in his charter to create the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, <clears throat> which banned slavery in all the states 
in America. Now, I grew up in a state that never tasted the bitterness of slavery because an obscure pastor in a little town outside of Boston added the virtue of justice to his faith and became salt and light to his nation. The 13th Amendment to our Constitution reads the way it reads because an obscure pastor in a little town in Massachusetts asked himself this question. What kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God? And when Manasseh Cutler <clears throat> answered that question, well, it was clear to him and it was clear to the pioneers he represented that slavery was an unjust abomination. It was an unjust abomination because it was an outrageous mistreatment of men and women who bore God's image. The Bible says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who are made in God's likeness, in his image. And then he adds, my brothers... This should not be. Now, if it is unjust to even speak to an image bearer like he is a dog, then it is certainly unjust to make him your slave and treat him like one. Justice isn't hard to figure out. All you have to do is ask yourself the question, what kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God? Anyone can answer that question. Anyone can. If you're not sure, read the Bible. Because the Bible answers that question over and over again in command and, and prohibition after command and prohibition. Six of the Ten Commandments spell out specifically how you are to treat an image bearer justly. It's not hard to answer that question. Anyone can answer that question. It's just hard. It's not hard to figure out what we should do. It's just hard to do it. Because it's often much easier to get what we want if we ignore justice and treat our neighbor like a dog rather than treating him like an image bearer. Now, Manasseh Cutler asked himself that simple question 236 years ago when he wanted to address one of the major injustices of his day. And if you and I want to address the... Uh, Injustices of our day, we must ask ourselves the same question. What kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God? Because justice doesn't ask, hey, what's your race? Hey, what's your gender? What's your pronoun? What's your religion? What's your politics? Who's your friend? What's your social status? And then based upon that answer, decide whether you have the right to be treated with respect, dignity, and fairness. Now, justice ignores all of those questions and asks only one. Does the person standing in front of me bear the image of God? And if the answer is yes, and it always is, then it doesn't matter what his race or his gender or his pronoun or his religion is. It doesn't matter if she's a Democrat or a Republican, wealthy or poor, if they grew up in the Hamptons or if they grew up in Harlem. It doesn't matter to justice. If the person standing in front of me bears the image of God, then that and that alone gives that person a dignity and a worth that I must recognize and I must celebrate if justice is to roll down like a river. Justice is built on the biblical truth that my neighbor is an image bearer just like me and therefore my neighbor possesses the same innate value and dignity that I do. And because he does, my neighbor has the exact same rights that I do. And he is due the exact same respect, dignity, and fair treatment that I am due. Not because he's good, often he is not, but because he bears the image of our Creator. Now our dignity, your dignity, my dignity, your dignity, your worth isn't earned by your success and it isn't conferred upon you by the approval of others. Your dignity, your worth is a free gift from God that is rooted in the truth that you, you were made in his image. Now just men recognize that truth and they revere that truth. And they spend their lives trying to figure out how to treat others with the fairness and respect and the dignity. Do an image bearer. And as they do, they add the virtue of justice to their faith. But evil men, 
Evil men mock that truth and evil men ignore that truth and they spend their lives demanding fairness and respect and dignity for themselves while denying it to others. Now it's true, it's true. You can deny that human beings are, were created in the image of God. Many do. But when that truth dies in your heart, my friends, justice is buried with it. And when that truth dies in the heart of a nation, justice is put in the grave right alongside of it. Because if there is no creator, if we are just a collection of carbon atoms that somehow randomly stumbled into life, if that's all we are, well, then we have no more worth, no more dignity, no more right to fair treatment than the amoeba from which we sprang. If you are just a cosmic accident, I don't, I don't have to treat you justly. If you are a cosmic accident, I could just, I, mean, I have a grievance with you. I can pick up a gun, walk into a school, walk into a Bible study, walk into an office, walk into a mall, and just start shooting. I don't have to treat you fairly. I don't have to tell you the truth. I don't have to treat you with respect. If you're a cosmic accident, I can assault you on the street. I can break into your house and take your stuff. I can cheat you in a business deal. I can lie about you in court. I can sleep with your wife. It doesn't matter. But if you bear the image of God, then all of those things, all of those things are profoundly unjust because they are an insult to your innate value and dignity and a violation of your inalienable rights as an image bearer. But if you and I, if we don't want to live in a world that treats us like a cosmic accident, and that's where we are today, if we don't want to live in a world like that, we can't just be critics. We have to be examples. We have to add the virtue of justice to our faith, and we have to become, we have to become salt and light to a spiritually dark and morally decaying world that has lost its way because it's forgotten that men and women are made in the image of God. When someone treats you like a dog, you can do the easy thing, or you can do the hard thing. When someone treats you like a dog, we can't do that easy thing if you want to be the example. We have to do the hard thing and ask ourselves, what kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God, even if they are being mean, distrustful, abusive to me? How should I treat that person who bears the image of God? The answer is, ne is never that hard to find. It's just hard to do. But if we as Christians won't do it, who will? Who will? Now, you may be more educated, more attractive, more sophisticated than, you, than your neighbor. You may dress better, make more money, have better friends, and have more power than they do. But none of those things add one iota to your innate value or your dignity as an image bearer. Those things make your life easier, but they don't, they don't increase your worth as a human being. They don't entitle you to special rights. They don't confer on you any special status in the eyes of justice. But here's the other side of that truth. The opposite is also true. Growing up poor, growing, going to a one-room schoolhouse, wearing hand-me-down clothes, being marginalized in society, those things don't entitle me to special rights either. Those things don't give me a favored status in the eyes of justice either. The Bible says that favoritism to the poor and the marginalized is a perversion of justice, just like favoritism to the rich and the powerful is. Because the rich, being rich doesn't give you special rights or special value, and being poor doesn't either. Here's what the Bible says. Here's how God says it. He says, do not pervert justice. Do not pervert it. Well, how would I pervert it, Lord? Do not show partiality. To who, Lord? To who? Well, to the poor. Or favoritism to the great. Don't do it. Don't show favoritism to either. He says, but judge your neighbor fairly. Judge him as an equal, as an image bearer who has the same rights and dignity you have. That's why Lady Justice is blindfolded with a balance in her hand. 
Because it doesn't matter to justice if you're rich or you're poor or you're somewhere in between. It doesn't matter to justice if you're a man or a woman or you can't figure out which one you are. It doesn't matter if you're black or brown or white or purple. It doesn't matter. What matters to justice is that you bear the image of God and therefore you possess an innate value and innate dignity that gives you the inalienable right to be treated with fairness and respect. Now, it is absolutely true that God calls upon us as Christians to come to the aid of the poor and the mistreated and the marginalized. He calls upon us to protect the rights of, the, of those folks, of folks that are in that situation, and to ensure that they are treated with the same, not greater, with the same, not less, with the same respect and dignity that the wealthy man is. Because the poor man bears the image of God just like the wealthy man does. But if, if, if we advocate for the rights and the value and the dignity of those who have less by trampling on the rights and the value and the dignity of those who have more, we have not created justice. We have perverted it. When we tell the marginalized in our society they can mistreat those who have more, when we tell them that they can ignore their neighbor's rights and take what they want to them because they're an oppressed class of people who therefore have special rights, we don't have justice. We have Marxism. You can put lipstick on that and you can call it social justice, but it's never just to demand fairness and respect and dignity for me while denying it to you because you have more than me. That's not justice. That is envy. That is not the teachings of Jesus Christ. That is the teachings of Karl Marx. Now, if you are drawn to the social justice movement because the name sounds good and you like some of the things they say, I would encourage you to keep the baby and throw out the bathwater. Keep your compassion for the poor. Keep your heart for the mistreated. God wants to use that in the advancement of his kingdom. But throw out Marxism and add true justice to your faith and become salt and light to this dark and decaying world. Because the social justice movement is not built on the Bible. It is built on Marxism. And Marxism, it denies the existence of God. It hates the Bible. And it hates everyone who follows its teachings. The proponents of Marxism and the social justice movement make their own opinions, their own opinions, the sole authority for what is right and wrong in this world. You say, that's not true, Steve. Well, listen to one of, the, one of the thought leaders of the social justice movement. His name's Jeremy Rufkin. He says this, we make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to any outside forces. Add their Bible, God, Constitution, law. We no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are the architects of the universe. We are responsible for nothing outside of ourselves, for we are the kingdom, we are the power, and we are the glory forever, end quote. Now, I don't know about you. That doesn't sound like Jesus to me. So if your social justice friends are saying they're telling you they want to help you deconstruct your faith and deconstruct your family and deconstruct your racist nation, beware. Because what they really mean is they want to help you destroy all three because they hate all of them. They want to wipe all of them out. Now, if you want to know more about the difference between justice, real justice, and the social justice movement, I'd encourage you, do some reading. Read Scott Allen's book entitled, Why Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice. It's worth the read. Excellent book written by a man who was drawn to the social, mo- mo- by the social justice movement because he liked the name and he liked some of the things he said. But once he got inside, he realized this is a wolf in sheep's clothing and he got out of it. Read the book. Now, I'm not denying that powerful people sometimes mistreat us. That's why we call it injustice. But what we're going to see in today's passage is that being mistreated by a powerful person doesn't give us permission to do the same. If it's unjust for my offender to treat me as less than an image bearer to get what he wants, it's just as unjust for me to treat my offender as less than an image bearer to get what I want. Door swings both ways. 
Because justice always, always, always asks, what kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God? And that is easy to answer if the person standing in front of me is treating me with fairness and respect and dignity. That's easy. But when the person standing in front of me is trampling on my rights and treating me like a dog, it is much harder to add justice to my faith and treat that man and treat that woman like an image bearer. And yet, and yet, that is exactly what the virtue of justice demands of us. Because the person standing in front of us, we do it not because, we do this but not because the person standing in front of us is good. He often is not. We do it because he bears the image of God. Just like we do. Now the passage we're going to look at today, in this passage, David's rights as an image bearer are being trampled by King Saul. David is being hunted and persecuted by the most powerful man in Israel, not because he's betrayed the king or acted unjustly, but because King Saul wants what King Saul wants. And what King Saul wants is he wants his son Jonathan to be king rather than David, even though God has anointed David to be the next king. But ironically, ironically, in the middle of all the injustice that David is enduring, he is learning a very important lesson about justice. Because the virtue of justice isn't just developed in us when our life is easy and when our life is fair. It is also developed in us and often profoundly developed in us when our life is hard and when our life is very unfair. Now, David's going to be the next king of Israel. But if he is going to be a just king, if he's going to be that kind of a king, then he has to learn how to treat those who mistreat him with fairness, with respect, and with dignity. Not because they are good. Many of them are not. But because they bear God's image. And that brings us to this important life principle. I develop this virtue of justice when I do something pretty hard to do. When I treat a person like an image bearer, even though they're not acting like one. Now, you have lots of people in your life that aren't acting like image bearers. But if you want to be a just person, if you want to add justice to your faith, you have to treat them like one, even though they're not acting like one. Now, when King, when King Saul targeted David, David became hunted uh, and a homeless man. He hid in caves and ravines in Israel, was forced to depend on the generosity of others just to survive. Weeks turned into months, months turns into years, and there was no relief. Saul, David spent his life one step ahead of, of Saul's henchmen. And the longer that David evaded Saul, the more obsessed Saul became with capturing him. And so in 1 Samuel 24, when Saul received word that David was hiding in the desert of Judah, Saul took 3,000 of his best men and swept down into that desert to capture David so he could get rid of this nemesis that was getting in the way of his plans. Now, fortunately for David, the deserts of Judah are peppered with caves that he could hide in. But as King Saul came down there, began searching for David, he's marching and riding and working and back and forth trying to find him. All of a sudden, nature called. And Saul needed some privacy. And so he ducked into a nearby cave, you know, to take care of business. But wouldn't you know it? Saul ducked into the very cave that David and his men were hiding in. Saul couldn't see David hiding back in the, in the dark recesses of the cave, but Saul was skylighted in the, in the entrance of that cave, and David could see him clearly. David's men begged him, begged him, seize this opportunity, kill your oppressor. One quick blow from your sword, David, and your troubles will be over, and that crown will be sitting on your head. But David refused. And he said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing, such an unjust thing. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. So why didn't Saul kill, or why didn't David kill King Saul when he had this chance? Why, why, why didn't he just get rid of his tormentor? Because Saul, the man who had the crown sitting on top of his head, was an image bearer. And therefore, he should be treated as one, even though he was not acting like one. When God said, you shall not murder, he didn't say, well, unless he's mean to you. Then you can murder him. 
Now, if Saul had seen him, drawn his sword, came back after David to take his life, Saul, he could have drawn his sword and protected himself as one image bearer, trying to keep another image bearer from killing him. That's different. But to sneak up on Saul while he is relieving himself in a cave and assassinate him in cold blood, that's unjust. That's murder. And David would have no part of it. Saul was an image bearer. And God had placed the crown upon the, on the head of that image bearer, even though he was not a good man. And so David chose justice, and he refused to murder him, even though doing so would have made his life much easier. Now, David didn't kill Saul that day, but he did confront him, and he did rebuke him for his unjust behavior. When Saul, when, when David, or when Saul was um, inside of that cave, and he was... Uh, about to take care of business, he took off his robe and laid it aside. And so David snuck up and he cut off a piece of that robe and then went back into the darkness. And when Saul left the cave and he was a safe distance away from David, David came out of the cave and he called to Saul. And when Saul turned around, he held up that piece of, of, his, of his robe and he said, see, I was that close to you. If I wanted to kill you and I wanted to take your crown, I could have but I didn't. Then he said this to Saul, Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord avenge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. The Lord may smite you, but I will not. Now, Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you'll be like him. That is, if you mistreat and abuse those who mistreat and abuse you, you've become an unjust fool just like them. You, can't, you can never balance the scales of justice by acting unjustly yourself. You can't do wrong to do right. However, that doesn't mean that we just take the mistreatment and do nothing. For the very next verse, after verse 4 in verse 5, the Bible says, But answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That is, answer a fool in a way that exposes him as a fool and rebukes him for his unjust folly. Which is exactly what David did when he held up that piece of the robe that he cut off from, from Saul's robe and said, Look, I could have killed you. But I didn't. I have done nothing to you, but you are waging a vendetta against me. I will not smite you. The Lord may smite you, but I will not. Now, Saul's conscience was stricken, and he stopped chasing David for a period of time. But soon fear and folly won over, and Saul began hunting, da began hunting David again. You know, the Bible says that the pig returns to its mire, and Saul returned to his injustice. Now, David managed to stay uh, a step ahead of King Saul after that. Next few months, when he started hunting him again, he stayed ahead of King Saul month after month, but then the people of Ziph betrayed David. And uh, once again, Saul swooped into the town of Ziph with 3,000 men, just like he did out in the desert. And this time he made the foolish decision of camping right under David's nose. That night, David and a warrior, one of his warriors named Abishai, snuck down into the tent under the cover, or into Saul's camp under the cover of darkness, stood right over the king. And once again, King Saul's life was in David's hands. Abishai, Abishai knew David was not going to kill King Saul. And so he turned to him and said, I've got a spear. Let me just finish him. And David said, no, no. He said, the Lord will strike him in his time, but I will not lay my hand on the Lord's anointed. He didn't kill Saul that night, but he did take Saul's spear. He did take his water jug. And the next morning when, when Saul was a safe distance away, David once again answered the fool according to his folly and rebuked him, held up his spear and held up his water jug. He said, happened again, king. Could have killed you, but I didn't. Why are you, why are you carrying out this vendetta against me? I have done nothing to you, and yet you hunt me like a dog. Once again, stop, Saul stopped chasing David briefly, but soon he was right back at it. Now, 
Twice David had, the, had Saul's life in the palm of his hand and twice he refused to murder him. Why? Well, because David's life was guided by justice. He was by, guided by verses like Deuteronomy chapter 20, 16, verse 20. Follow justice and justice alone. So that, why should I be just to unjust people? He says, so that you may live. And you may possess the land that the Lord has given to you so that you may prosper and you may flourish in this broken world so you can make a difference in this world. You see, one of the keys to flourishing in this life as a Christian, as a parent, as a spouse, as a teacher, as a business person, as a health professional, one of the keys is to ask yourself this question in every one of your, of your relationships. What kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God? And once you have answered that question, do it. Even when it's hard, do it. Because when you do, you add the virtue of justice to your faith. And it gives you a chance to be salt and light to a dark and decaying world. Now, Nisi Coates is a journalist. He's an author. and He's one of the architects of the social justice movement. He grew up in Baltimore. In one of his books, he described to his son how he viewed the policemen and the firefighters who ran into the World Trade Center on 9-11 to save people's lives. To Coates, these men and women were white supremacists who were oppressing people like him. And so he told his son, and I quote, they were not human to me. Black, white, whatever. They were menaces of nature. They were the fire, the comet. The storm, things that could, without justification, shatter my body. Now, David viewed the man who was persecuting him as an image bearer, and therefore he refused to kill him, even though it would have made his life easier. Neasy Coates viewed the police and the firefighters at the World Trade Center as subhuman. He said they weren't human to me. He viewed them as menaces of nature, like insects. And therefore, he applauded their deaths because, in his opinion, they were racists and white supremacists who had no value, they had no dignity, and therefore they had no rights. And that, in a nutshell, my friend, is the difference between real justice and the social justice movement. Because if the truth that a men and women are image bearers, if that truth dies in your heart, justice will be buried with it. But if we ask ourselves, what kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God? We will not only treat men and women justly, but we will also right the wrongs that we can by giving both the victim and offenders their due. And that's this last principle I want to talk to you about. I developed this virtue of justice in my life when I set wrongs right by giving both victims and offenders their due. What is due a victim who is violated by another person? What is due an offender who is harmed an image bearer and yet is an image bearer themselves? So David refused to take Saul's life because he knew that at some point Saul would outrun the, just, the mercy of God and his life would come to an end. And that day came in the battle of Mount Gilboa. Jonathan, Saul's son, died in that battle and, and uh, Saul was gravely wounded. He didn't want the Philistines to capture him alive, so he asked his armor bearer to kill him. He said, no, I won't do that. That's unjust. Be murder. I'm not doing it. No. And so Saul fell on his own sword in an attempt to take his own life, but he failed at that too. And that's when this Amalekite, a guy in Amalekite, came across Saul writhing in pain, but not dead yet. And he assumed, this Amalekite assumed that if he killed King Saul and brought his crown to David, that David would show his gratitude to him by making him a wealthy man. But when he showed up at David's camp with Saul's crown in his hand and a story to tell, things didn't turn out quite the way he planned. The Bible tells us that David turned to him and asked him, why were you not afraid? Why were you not afraid to lift up your hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? Why did you do this unjust thing? What, th what made you think you had the right to do that to him? And then David called upon one of his men and said, you strike him down. Go strike him down. And so he struck him down and he died. And David said to this Amalekite, your blood is on your own head. For your own mouth testified against you when you said, you confessed, you bragged. I killed the Lord's anointed. 
See, Saul had hunted and, and hounded David for 12 years and made his life an absolute hell. And yet David held Saul's life sacred, not because Saul was a good man, he was not, but because this man that wore the crown bore the image of God. And so, when this Amalekite took Saul's life to curry his, David's favor, David made a, uh, made a de decision right there as the new king of Israel. And he set that wrong right. And this Amalekite, by his own testimony, had murdered the king. He confessed to it openly and bragged about it. And so David executed him for his crime. You see, when you ask the question, what kind of treatment is due a person who bears the image of God, it not only obligates us to treat our neighbor with respect and fairness and dignity, it also obligates us to celebrate the worth of the victim by rendering a just consequence to those who mistreat them. And it obligates us to make sure that the consequences that we mete out to an offender fit the crime and do not violate his value or treat him unfairly. You know, we... Uh, this principle you hear often and hear it scoffed and mocked is called an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. People scoff it and say that it's cruelty. It's not cruelty, it's shorthand. For consequences must fit the crime. That is, if you can't kill an image bearer for knocking out his tooth. If, you knock, if an image bearer knocks out your tooth, you can't kill him. It's that eye for an eye. It's a tooth for a tooth, not a life for a tooth. To balance the scales of justice, the offender doesn't owe me his life. He owes me the cost of repairing my tooth. But the problem that the Amalekite was facing was that he hadn't just knocked out a man's tooth. He had taken the life of an image bearer. And when you take the life of an image bearer, the only thing that you possess that is of equal value to what you have taken is your own life as an image bearer. And so the Amalekite forfeited his life for his crime to balance the scales of justice because it was his due and it was Saul's due. Now, love and justice are linked at the hip in the Bible. They're not the same thing. They are different, but they are linked like heads and tails of the same coin because in the Bible, justice, justice is always tempered by mercy. And in the Bible, love must always be just. Their heads and tails, we link them together. The prophet Micah said it like this. says, I've shown you, O man, what is good. You want to know what goodness is? Here's goodness. And what does the Lord require of you? Let me tell you what the Lord requires of you. To act justly. And at the same time, to love mercy. And if you're going to bring those two things together, he says, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to walk humbly with your God. You're going to have to say yes to him when it's easy. And you're going to have to say yes to him when it's hard. You know, in 2016, Rachel Dahl Hollander filed charges against Larry, uh, Larry Nasser for sexually assaulting her, which he also did to 260 other female athletes that was, competed for America. Ultimately, Nasser was sentenced to 40 to 60 years for his crimes in prison. But at his sentencing, Rachel was asked to address Nasser. She asked if she could direct, uh, address Nasser directly. And the, and the judge gave her permission and she ended her comments to him with these words. She said, and I quote, Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that's what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And those things will be there for you. I pray that you experience the soul-crushing weight of your guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. Now that, my friends, is justice tempered by mercy. But to do justice like that, you have to have the humility to say yes to God and do the next right thing for the right reason, even when it's hard. And when you do, you'll be salt and light in this world. And your life will flourish. God bless you. Have a great week. I'll be over here if I haven't met you. All right?